Uh, kia ora tato. welcome to uh, the fifth of these late events. Uh, before we get going, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Antoine Coffin from the museum uh, for our Kalihi. <coughs> Antoine. Uh, greetings to you all uh, this evening. I know my haramai, I can hear me Auckland Museum, Noreira, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. Hemiana Oki Tene, the Kitata Faria Apotunui, Akatepua Wayo Tiarua, Mena Tawa, Epakapirine, Epakapirine, Kitine, Wilene, Karitepo, Tanaka, Kitipiki, Akutoko, Nomai Haramai, Hemiana Tangata Firmu, Hemiana Kitiatua, Hemiana Kiakota Katoa, Tina Koto Katoa. So I'm just uh, acknowledging everybody, everything, and all of the things that we're going to be talking about this evening. Kia ora, have a great time. Tonight, it's our virtual identity. Uh, in the age of MySpace and Facebook and Twitter, the blogosphere, and all forms of digital social networking, to what extent have our individual and collective identities been shaped by the new technologies and the way we use them? Really? But first of all, I'd like to kick off by just asking the panel um, for some brief introductory remarks. And I thought the starting point might as well be what they really thought when I mentioned or when they heard that the topic for tonight would be this concept of virtual identity. Um, so in no particular order, um, Nat, <laughs> when you looked at the topic for discussion here, um, did it make you think anything about how we've developed in the last 12 or 14 years we could even have a discussion like this? What were your thoughts? Yeah, I'm I'm used to a lot of people talking about the word virtual in the context of um, these fake 3D worlds like, like Second Life. And that's sort of a science fictional view of what virtual identity is. That you create this incredibly elaborate avatar full of 3D intricacies and you can, you can be a paladin in this dynamic world or you can be a, a, a crab and you, you exist in this completely fictional universe. Um, that's an extreme occupied by a minority of people and most of us live in this bulk world where we we have, use email, some of us IM, some of us have Facebook pages and each of those things is leaving digital traces around of us. Things that can be found with Google, things that our friends learn about us, ideas that our, people, that, uh, our acquaintances have of us purely through the, uh, the digital medium and I'm aware that that is a much more mundane, much less sexy um, television screenshot than something from Second Life. But it's also the far more practical and pragmatic world that we live in, where we, we are all creating virtual identities for ourselves. Wayne, you've been a virtual crab. Tell us all about it. <laughs> I'd just like to respond to these previous comments, which to my mind are far too sanguine. Um, <laughs> I'm the dystopian line here tonight. If it is true, as our last speaker has suggested, that the construction of virtual cells is a prosaic thing that happens in everyday life, and it's not the extreme case of avatars that we need to talk about anymore, my question is this, uh, whose um, virtual identity? Because one of these concerns that I have is that at the same time as these technologies have come on board over the last 15 years, there's also been another profound social change happened at the same time. It's called the new right of neoliberalism. And to cut a long story short, at the same time as virtual technologies and digital technologies have arrived, we've also seen stark polarisations of um, wealth and poverty, not only between countries but within countries. And I think we have to think about the relationship between virtual media technologies on the one hand and social economic polarisation on the other. And I would argue the virtual identities that are constructed allow the rich to insulate themselves from the poor. They're locked off office buildings in their cars, um, their iPods, their iPhones regular plane travel and all the rest of it. And it leads to what Mike Davis, the urban geographer, has called space in apartheid, a stark social separation where the well-off want to seclude themselves from the dirty unwashed. One great thing about networks, not such a great thing, electronic networks don't just include people, they exclude others. So that's one of my main concerns. My second concern, as Finley alluded to, is time. And what I think has happened um, with the explosion of satellite technology, satellite television, the remediation of satellite television, so you've got um, the internet and cell phones, the way of receiving it, 
So you've got uh, digital cameras and other mobile technologies for news gathering. It speeds everything up. And we live in a world of the present. We live in a world of immediacy. We live in a world of rolling news, and breaking news. And that's the same with social networking sites as well. Uh, that's the same if you're on the net most of the time. Is you're living in a kind of a perpetual present. Do you share Wayne's dystopian view of this, being a user yourself of the technologies it's discussing? Can I just answer your first question? My thinking process is clearly far more succinct than anyone else's on this panel. This is what I thought when you said we're going to talk about virtual identity. That's why we had a woman on. Yeah. Um, I thought, oh, okay, we're going to talk about the identities or identity that we use online. That was it for me, and then I moved swiftly on to the next thing, which was to answer your questions, and then I put that aside, jumped over to Twitter, back to Facebook, <laughs> another couple of emails. What wrote, did you Twitter? Wrote, wrote, did you Twitter? I didn't I'm really be on the I'm just mad at them. But I might have done. Well, I did, I tweeted eventually, didn't I? I said I was looking forward to coming here. You really quite liked it. That's really, that's All right, really so you were saying. Well, that was really it. Anonymity and personality. That's what I thought, and well. then I started thinking about the things that I think about about identity, which are about how I um, assess authenticity online, which is the most immediate need that I have. I'm just like a, with all these new technologies, I'm just like a bulldozer, right? It's, they're just, it's just stuff to me, so I play around with it long enough to know how I can use it, and then I just forget the rest and bulldoze through and, and make it do what I want it to do. So that's, um, I guess, so in terms of identity, the thing that bugs me the most at the moment is trying to find out who people are. Like I like to engage with people online when I know something about them. First of all, tell me when you first Quick to Facebook and when you and your friends really adopted it hard? Um, well, there's definitely been a progression in the social networking sites. Um, when we were about 15 or 14, even younger, it was MySpace, um, which we quickly retired off, and then it was Bebo, which was short lived, definitely. Um, and now it's Facebook. Bebo is now considered totally tacky and completely uncool. Like, it's, you're not allowed to be on Bebo anymore. Um, so, I haven't been on Facebook that long, actually, which is surprising in how deeply entrenched I've become in it. It's only maybe been um, since the, just before the start of this year. So, so what, what were the aspects of Facebook that were so seductive compared to Google and MySpace? What, what's the, the Well, the, the major difference is, and now I've noticed actually in my um, secret Bebo sips, that they've been copying Facebook a little bit more now. Um, but the thing about Facebook is... So you just use terminology there, I know it's lost on some <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you want me to go into that? Go on, just briefly. Well, just quickly, a Facebook sift is just it's another way of saying that you are looking through Facebook, you're checking out everyone's profiles, you're looking at the news feed, you're seeing what people are doing. So it's just, go, it's just another way of saying you're logging on to Facebook, you're seeing what's up, mm. but everyone calls it the Facebook sift now. Um, uh, so, the thing that is interesting about Facebook and terribly addictive um, is that you can really track what people are doing in a way that you've never been able to on social networking sites before. Um, you have total control to go onto someone else's page, not just see if they've added new photos, but who they've been talking to, which photo, particular photo they commented on, and here's a link to go look at it if you want to, when they did it. You know, every every detail. So I always talk about Facebook in a way that the tagline should be, you can't help but stalk people, which is really ultimately true because it it's gives a brilliant motto. I just don't think they're gonna adopt it. No. <laughs> but it's totally true that you just it, it gives you it's inviting you. Come look, here's a link, see what they've said. Yeah. See what and, other people have said. and it's worth pointing out that if these are your friends, as they are, mm. it's not stalking in the negative sense, it's this new weird positive sense of stalking that we have where we do all the same things that we used to do when it was creepy but it doesn't end with something dis disgusting. But then you get into the whether it's this network Well, I don't know, but if you're young and you're using Facebook, it probably does end with something disgusting. But that's a good thing. But everything Monica's saying and, and everything I've kind of, not everything, I mean, I've found a bit utopian, dystopian about this, uh, suggests that there's the the possibility within all this technology for people to become complete solipsists, to become utterly self-absorbed and trapped in a sort of feedback loop of their own making. And in, far from being a social network, it becomes a mirror. Like, what do you think about that? Um, that I don't know, that's almost kind of a judgmental position. If people want to create a person for themselves online <coughs> and they're prepared to put the work into it uh, because they find the graph 
and I, I don't really have a problem with that. I mean, if you do something like, I mean, ha, Monica, how many are you and your friends one platform at a time? You all move at the same time, or do you have multiple profiles that you keep up? Uh, we're we're all pretty much only on Facebook. Right. Uh, like I say, we used to be on other ones, and then you go if you tried to go back to Bevo. If I tried to go back to Bevo now, none of my friends would be on it anymore, so it wouldn't be any gratification for me. So that's not solipsistic. That's something that relates directly to the real world and all the research about MySpace and Facebook and, and services like that says the same thing. The, the kids are more likely to friend um, people they actually see in their life. And the, the, the social relationships are largely based on real life relationships. Can, um, I, have, can I have a dystopian twist? A brief one. What about the virtual identity which bears less resemblance to your real identity? That, 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 that intrigues me a little bit because it strikes me this is the perfect opportunity to be a complete automatic, a fabulous. But that, that occasion happens many times in your life. Every time that you move into a situation you have no friends and no baggage, you're free to recreate yourself. Um, moving from high school to university is often that kind of occasion where it's a big, clean and sharp break and you get to try again. Take two. Maybe I'm something else. I'm going to try and be something else this time. And it's not a complete change and suddenly I'm a French exchange student and I'm uh, muscle bound and I play rugby. But <coughs> Um, instead, uh, it's just in more subtle ways. That, you know, rather than everybody assuming that I'm a dork and laughing as soon as I open my mouth, not that this is in any way autobiographical whatsoever, so I don't like to explain. Um, you, know, you get to start again. You have no preconceptions. And this, this is what you were talking about, and that people who may be laughed at in the yeah. real world suddenly are taken seriously and find that they can give voice to. And, and, it have, and, and it can have really profound benefits for your life. Um, a friend of mine was the usability manager for Trailing, and she went out and talked to uh, a whole bunch of their top traders, many of whom turned out to be people who had failed in real life, you had, you know, or, or who didn't really have other options. Um, kids who left school at 14, solo mothers and homeless to north, but they had found this thing worked for them. Well, no, I mean, you don't want to ask The value of time is living in Palmerston North. Yeah, it's Palmerston North. Yeah, that was a good Yes. Timaru again. Timaru. Um, <laughs> One thing we can all agree on. But the, the, there are not many ways in that position you can make 10 grand a month. And no, you trade me off of that. Don't be ridiculous, mate. Right? <laughs> conversations, I have a lot of them, but I also quite like my own space, I'm a very kind of private person, and I really like that layer between me and the world, I, I like being able to talk to people that way, once I know who I I find that ir irritating and prescriptive, I don't like any of the major, uh, Twitter, I can see the point of, Facebook and MySpace, I'm really just there, because I have to <coughs> Well you wrote something I think you've thought about, um, because we talk about networks now without even really defining them, uh, and you, as you say, group. What are the limits, if there are any, on, uh, on a person's network? How many people can you actually uh, cope with in your life? And does the technology make any difference to that? So in sociology there's a, uh, a number called Dunbar's number, which is the productive number of people that you can have a, a meaningful social relationship with at any one time. It's about 150. Uh, you, you max out your ability to have friends in the real world at, at 150. 150. That, you can have less, many many people have fewer friends than 150, but it's very, very difficult to have more because of the time it takes to have a meaningful interchange with someone that actually justifies calling them a friend. The, I find that the electronic tools that I have really help me um, amplify my Dunbar number. You know, I, I no longer have 150 friends that I consider to be good friends. I have many, many more. Because of the broadcast nature of these things, where I can take a photo of the things that I do with my kids and I can send it to 500 people and not to just 150, not one at a time, as in the old days. Suddenly, many more people are involved in how, I, um, how my family life is going, how my business life is going. Um, can you cope with that much um, response, though? I mean, 
there are still only 24 hours in the day. You have to in terms of fielding, this is one of my problems with uses of 